The Pickleball Show is brought to you by PBX Club. PBX stands for Pickleball Excellence. Join today and get the latest pickleball tips and strategies, news, and opinion. Save money on paddles and other equipment with coupon codes to online pickleball retailers. Get travel discounts to tournaments and a whole lot more. How much does it cost to become a PBX Club member? Well, it's free. Just go to freepbxclub.com. That's freepbxclub.com. There's even a link in the show notes for this episode. Free PBX Club. Dot com. PBX Pickleball Excellence. Join the club. It's free. Hello, my name's Wayne Mugley, Pickleball Lover, and here's the host of the Pickleball Show, Chris Allen. Thank you, Wayne, and welcome to the show dedicated to helping you play better pickleball while having even more fun and meeting new friends who share your passion for this great sport. My name is Chris Allen, and I'd like to thank you for joining us today and also thank everyone who has been sharing the links to the show via social media and telling uh, other folks who play in your local club about the Pickleball show we really really do appreciate your support all right let's see whose paddles are in the fence today joining us from collingwood ontario canada just a couple of hours north of toronto it's mark renison owner and coach at thirdshotsports.com hey mark hey chris how you doing doing great and joining us from grass valley california the one and only pickleball guru himself prame carno prame how are you today Thank you, Chris. Oh, I'm doing really well. Good deal. Now, today, gentlemen, the gloves are off. Today is an aggressive episode. We want to be the most aggressive pickleball players we can possibly be today. We want to play smart, Prem, because I know, you know, smart pickleball, love the book, love the new audio book, both available at Amazon.com. But we want to play smart and we want to play aggressive. Mark, what do you think about, I guess, taking more of an aggressive tactic, not uh, just waiting for the other team to make a mistake, but actually writing the script, making something happen, not necessarily looking to hit a winner all the time, but wanting to take the lead, earn the points rather than just have the points kind of uh, fall your way? Yeah, well, I think it's um, it's an interesting strategy. I think at uh, the highest levels, you're seeing it more and more where players are looking to take initiative and put pressure on on their opponents you know it can be very rewarding but it can also be pretty risky now let's say just for the sake of argument today that we're talking about 4-0 players and um you know so we're we're, we're past the the beginner stage and the newbie stage we're on to, to players that that know their way around the court and they know some angles and they they you know can handle themselves and uh, you can pretty much plug them into any situation and they're going to be pretty consistent and uh we, we want to just you know take it up a notch do you think that that is a, a more aggressive strategy is a good strategy when you're in that you know intermediate to upper intermediate range uh, it can be right it's it's all about playing smart you know as Prem is an expert on it's very much about doing the right thing at the right time I would caution listeners to to remember when we're talking about being aggressive or when we're talking about going on offense that can include hitting balls fast but it doesn't have to right it can also include taking the ball on the rise, right? hitting the ball earlier. It can also include uh, aiming near a sideline when you're hitting your serve. So hitting the ball hard is an offensive strategy, but it's not the only one. And it doesn't mean instantly. It doesn't mean a power strategy. It can also mean a, a, a precise placement strategy as well. It might include shots that are really fast and hard hit, but doesn't necessarily have to. Well said. Prem, how does smart pickleball and aggressive pickleball, where's the intersection? Where do those two meet? Can you play smart pickleball and also play very aggressive pickleball? Absolutely. There is a, there is a sometimes a, a skewed or a, a, a negative impression when I talk about smart pickleball because people think smart pickleball is all playing soft or and I, I want to actually be very clear to... Uh, all the listeners here that smart pickleball is not about playing soft it's all about playing smart what does that imply I often talk about this in my classes I talk about it as a crouching tiger technique let me expound on the crouching tiger technique so I often say say for example a tiger is about to attack a deer what does it do before it does that so I'll, I'll ask that question to you, Chris. So what does a tiger do before it attacks that deer? It goes low and, and gets very still and very silent. 
and just waits for the perfect opportunity. And that perfect opportunity arises when? Mm, when the deer exposes some sort of a weakness. Which is what? Mm, a lot of times the attention will be away, it'll, it'll be relaxed, it'll think that uh, it's safe. Exactly. Or it's not paying attention. Mm -hmm. And then that's when the, the tiger pounces. And so it's in the same way, the same analogy is true in pickleball, is you're playing that soft game, you're, you're playing it, waiting for the opponent to see whether they are, the paddle is down or they are not in position and they are, you know, uh, not paying attention. That's when you're going to attack and pounce on them when they are not ready for that. And so the, the, that's the technique I often say is like, I'm asking you to be aggressive, but just be more smart about it, knowing when to get aggressive, not to hit just because you have a hard ball to hit. Mm -hmm. And I often say is that if your opponent is locked and loaded and if he is ready, do not hit a hard ball at them if you know they are ready. There's no point. It's the same thing as if a deer is watching the tiger. There's no way the tiger is able to catch that deer. There's no way it can attack it. Because it, the it's deer anticipating the pounce. It knows it's, it's about to get pounced upon, and so it's ready to react one way or the other. Exactly. It, so even that smartest, the strongest feline out there is patiently waiting to pounce because it's waiting when the opponent is not ready. And so that's when you want to attack. I'm not saying not to attack. I'm asking you to be smart about it. That's what I want to make sure people understand that uh, it's not about all soft game. It's all about knowing when to attack. Smart pickleball is selectively aggressive pickleball. That's right. That's a great way to put it, and a great uh, metaphor with the crouching tiger that uh, really makes sense. Because I think a lot of people do get lulled into the, well, I'm just going to hit it back and wait for the other team to make a mistake. And, and they, I think they get too complacent in a lot, of, uh, a lot of occasions. And I think that maybe people have bought into that a little too much, that, oh, no, you know, 75% of the points will come from unforced errors on the other side of the net. And so all I have to do is feed it back to them, just keep giving them opportunities to make a mistake, and eventually they'll slip up. As you go up into the higher levels, though, I don't think that that holds nearly as much water as it does in the lower levels. What do you think, Mark? I think that what counts as a mistake changes at higher levels. So um, if you go back to the first example you gave, right, the, the new players are getting out, um, I'm just going to wait until the other people make a mistake. The assumption sort of when you have that conversation with novice or intermediate players is a mistake is my opponents will miss the shot. Mm -hmm. They will get mm -hmm. it out. That might be what constitutes a mistake at a 3-0, a 3-5, even a 4-0 level. But once you start to get up to those top levels, a mistake isn't a ball that's hit out. A mistake is a ball that's hit slightly too high that the opponents at the, at the kitchen line can just put it away, mm -hmm. right? So that was my, my biggest takeaway from playing Staub and Bagley uh, a few months ago, was that if you hit it just a little bit too high over the net, where they can now drive the ball at you, which looks like an aggressive act, they were just capitalizing on my mistake. And my mistake wasn't mm -hmm. hitting out. My mistake was letting that ball sit up a bit too high, right? Or hitting the, hitting the return a little too short, right? So so the nature of mistakes changes as the levels increase. You're right on the money there, uh, Mark. Uh, that's that's what I mean in, in terms of in the higher levels, especially when I'm talking about someone's dropping a paddle, someone is not in position, someone is hitting a, sh a high ball, or you know even the dink, a little higher dink, and that's what you're waiting for in the highest level. But uh, to, to go back to what Chris was talking about in the 4.0 level as an example, those mistakes will also be included along with other mistakes they make as far as hitting it out and all that. But it's a, it's an old school of thought, uh, uh, the, the whole slow game, dinking game, which dominated uh, for a few number of years when the game uh, first started becoming more exposed. A lot of players play that game and uh, dominated it. But as, uh, as we start seeing more and more great racket sport players coming into this game, today's game is actually a, a perfect hybrid between the soft and the aggressive game. As uh, Mark mentioned, Phil Bagley and uh, Brian Staub are perfect examples of uh, the blend between those two games they have, which make them so, so competitive. That's what I think uh, the game is heading towards. It's the blend between those two games. An all-out aggression game is not going to work, or all-out soft game is not going to work either. 
but the blend between the two and knowing to master both those styles of game will give you a perfect quality as as a higher level player well and i've mentioned this before that uh it, it's sort of like when you watch uh, the old westerns uh when the the gunslinger would go into the bar and everybody is very calm and cool and collected because everybody in the in the bar knows that everybody else has a gun and so nobody wants to make any false moves or sudden moves you know when you watch the nationals when you watch the top level players they do tend to play the soft game a lot especially on the the men's side even more than the women's side and Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of that is because none of them wants to make that first false move none of them wants to hit that little high ball that sits up just a split second too long and then somebody else can pounce on it does that give people in the three five even 4.0 level does it give them a false sense of the importance of the soft game just because when you watch the top players they are playing a little bit more of a soft game than you need to and maybe not as much of an aggressive game as somebody in the in the intermediate or upper intermediate level would yeah i think it does i think that there's a misunderstanding out there and the misunderstanding is that good players hit soft, Mm -hmm. or that uh, dinking is the proper way to play pickleball. That's not true. Uh, Good players hit soft when it's smart to hit soft, and good players hit hard when it's smart to hit hard. And one of the things that separates them is not just the ability to do those different kinds of shots, but the understanding and the decision-making skills about when to do them. It goes back to shot selection again, like we've talked about in previous episodes, that shot selection is key. Right, and when you see players play that third shot drop and then immediately into this stinking rally, it's not because it's the right way to play. It's because at that level, the guys on the other side of the net, or the women on the other side of that net, their volleys are so good that even if you do drive it at them, that they will likely punish you for that. And so the, the false sense is that when, when other people watch, uh, you know, on YouTube, FIFO level players, they see that and they think, oh, I guess... I guess I have to hit a third shot drop. I guess I have to only dink. Uh, but what they're misunderstanding is is the reasoning behind that. Right. Mm-hmm. So if, if their opponent is not a really strong volleyer, then it could make sense. You know, you hit the serve, the return comes back, your opponents come in. It could make sense to drive it at them because they're not volleying at a 5-0 level. It's important, uh, and this is why I like so much of what Prem does, it's important not just to be able to hit shots, but to understand when those shots are appropriate. And what's the best way, Prem, to, to learn uh, besides just playing all the time? Is there a way to practice when those shots are important or drill? I, I, we keep going back to that theme, I guess, because I'm obsessed with it. How do you drill shot selection? How do you learn shot selection? And uh, Mark has a great video on that. But uh, what, what do you think, Prem? Is there a way to, in practice, to differentiate between this is an opportunity and this is not a good opportunity? To give you an example of it, like if you say, like let's uh, let's take a, a, what I would call a dinking drill. So you have four players uh, at the kitchen line, two on either side of the net, and you're dinking. So let's say you have to dink twenty times inside that in that non volley zone before you hit a winning shot, mm-hmm. and it could be anything. It doesn't mean that after twenty you have to hit the winning shot. Twenty is your minimum. You have to keep hitting inside the the, the kitchen before you can hit a power shot or lob or you know a drive whatever you want so and but here is the thing the key is i often say this one in in in, uh, in dinking games is i talk about uh, in, uh, in placement and positioning classes i talk about dancing with your partner so when you dink you move along especially where the ball is so basically your ball is dictating the positioning of where you're going to position yourself on the court Mm -hmm. Uh, not going into the technicality of it basically when you're dinking 20 times you are keep dinking and keep seeing where your opponents are moving and after 20 maybe the 21st ball but maybe it might be the 40th ball you might see your opponents are not more in position they're not more in position in the sense like you might hit one ball on the angle and one person follows and the other person has not followed him or her, then you know you've got the opening, and that's when you're going to try and hit that winner. That's what your shot selection has to be, is to hit a new shot in the middle. And as I mentioned in that previous episode, no good player I've seen will hit anything outside that premises of in the middle shot where it's between the players. Most probably they will hit that shot in the middle between them, 
they'll try to split the, uh, the the opponents and go for the middle rather than try and hit shots you know on the angles painting, painting the, the lines, lines is not a not a good strategy it's not smart smart pickleball it's not spot it's no. not spot pickleball but doesn't mean that you can't do it again if you do it it's mostly when you actually have your opponents off position mm-hmm. rather than trying to do that if you have them all away on one side then you're trying to paint the line then it's okay but trying to you know, we don't have a tennis court. Uh, it's a pickleball court. It's not without a lot of space. So you're not having that much of space to actually drive between the player and the line mm-hmm. uh, if you were trying to hit a winner. You might get away with it once in a while, but I think the smart decision will be to hit it in between them. In the middle. So that's the that dink rally would give you, you know, after 20 times you do that particular exercise, and then you move your opponents back and forth and see you get the opening in the middle, hit it there. If you don't see their paddle up and be in a ready position, hit at them. And then you will probably see you might hit a winner because they're not ready for that shot. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense, Mark? What do you think? Yeah, I think um, I think that does make a lot of sense. I know in the clinics that we run, decision-making is a, is a real foundation. Decision-making skills can be developed even at the beginner level. I find in my coaching, decision-making is very tough to work on and develop. Like other skills, it takes repetition, it takes deliberate practice, it takes focus. So it really needs to be sort of trained the same way that you would practice another skill. I find it's uh, quite important to involve the students verbalizing what it is they're thinking. So we made some videos about this. Uh, One, for example, about when you're at the kitchen line, uh, when to drive the ball because it's slightly above net level versus when to play a drop back over the net. And um, and as we do that, I, I don't just ask my players to work on it, but they have to call out drive or drop, drive or drop, because that tells me as the coach not just what decision they're making, but how quickly they're making that decision. So good decision making involves being both correct and being quick, right? Making the right decision at the right time. Mm-hmm. And it can be a tricky thing to work on, but it, but it most certainly can be developed. Now, pickleball is unique in that it is, uh, if not the only, one of the few sports where the receiving team actually has the advantage. The serving team is at a disadvantage. Is there a time to be more aggressive? Is it better to be more aggressive when you're on one side of that equation than the other? What do you think, Prem? Definitely uh, being on the returning side gives you a lot of advantage, as your statistics say, and I agree with that. But the returning team being aggressive is always a very good strategy to be more more aggressive. I mean, you have the, the natural advantage of, of half, half of your team is up at the line already, and the other Absolutely. half is going to be there uh, normally within that shot. So that gives you more of an opportunity to play on the edge, play more aggressively as a serving team. Uh, what's the best way to combat that? The best way to combat that, depending on, again, the skill level you're playing with. If you are, and I often uh, talk about this third, famous third shot in question, um, I would actually quote my uh, fellow coach and uh, friend, uh, Mark Friedenberg. Mark Yoda Friedenberg. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yes. And uh, Yoda would say something like the third shot would be whatever you want it to be. He finished it with that, but I often basically add the little suspension points to it. I said, uh, after that is basically the third shot is whatever you want it to be, depending on where your opponents are. So imagine, for example, someone who's returning a ball and has not reached the kitchen line. Please do not try and hit a drop shot at that point. Drive it at their feet. Keep them away from that kitchen line if you can. Don't try and drop a drop shot because that's what they, someone told you, that the third shot has to be a drop shot. It's not. Somebody called it sending an invitation. Don't send them an invitation up to the line to join you exactly. at the line. <laughs> Absolutely. If they're not there, do not bring them there. So that is one of the examples. Like if you see someone not coming to that kitchen line right away, drive. And, you know, sometimes you might see someone who's not ready and, you know, they might have their paddle all the way down to their to their shorts. And if that is the case, drive at them. You know, they might get the ball back, but you might probably know that they are probably going to pop that ball because they're bringing the paddle from low to high, which means that ball is going to travel higher from that particular point, which gives you a point to be aggressive. So there are, you know, opportunities as a serving team, you can use that uh, uh, to be aggressive. Uh, most probably, uh, my the times I tend to be aggressive is when I see my opponent not ready, which means when their paddle is not up there. Good advice. Sometimes when I play aggressively, 
I turn into a ball hog, uh, to put it frankly, because for me, it's hard to separate playing aggressively without wanting to just go after everything. And uh, the more aggressive I get, the more I reach in into my into my partner's area, the more I hit balls that are probably going to go out. What's the is there a trick to playing aggressively and, and, and still not being a ball hog and still being respectful of your partner? Well, no offense, Chris, but it sounds like you would be a terrible tiger who would not catch, <laughs> <laughs> who would not catch very many deer at all if you're going after anything that moves. Yeah, none taken. You're yeah. right. <laughs> um, no, so so I do I do think that uh, I mentioned before how um, being aggressive or going on offense is not the same necessarily as hitting the ball hard. I think the more that you the more that you get used to it, right? The way we talked about setting up drills or training situations where you get to practice that. The more that that's a familiar environment for you, the less jumpy you'll be, the less likely you'll go for anything. Right? Yeah. But you need, to, you need to be comfortable in that environment where you're looking to pounce. This is why if you, if you can find a good coach to work with, right, someone that you trust, that they know what they're doing, that that will be really beneficial. Because otherwise, you're right, you start to, you go from zero to 100 in mm. a second, and consequently, you make bad decisions and you make lots of errors. That is for sure, and it's uh, you both have given me plenty of things to work on today, so I certainly uh, do appreciate that. We've been talking with Prem Carno from the PickleballGuru.com, and uh, also uh, Prem has SmartPickleball.com, and Smart Pickleball, the book, is available at Amazon.com, also the audiobook version available at Audible.com, and also at Amazon. We'll link to those. And Mark Rennison from Collingwood, Ontario, Canada, ThirdShotSports.com is where you can find out more of what Mark is up to. And both of these gentlemen have great newsletters that they deliver via email. And uh, I am a subscriber to both of your newsletters. You should sign up and subscribe to them as well. Uh, Tons of great information in there. Gentlemen, thank you both. We really appreciate it today. Thank you very much, Chris. And we'd like to thank you for joining us today as well. Hey, have you gotten your copy of the top 10 tips from Pickleball's three greatest coaches? Coach Mo, Deb Harrison, Prame Carnot, all together in one quick study guide that will definitely take your game to the next level. It's absolutely free. You don't need a credit card. All you need is an email address. Just head over to freepbxclub.com. That's freepbxclub.com. We'll send it right out to you. Also, head over to iTunes. Hit that subscribe button. You'll never miss an episode of the Pickleball Show. Plus, if you feel it's appropriate, leave us a five-star review, which boosts us up in the rankings and makes it a lot easier for other pickleball players around the world to find this show. I'm Chris Allen. This is the Pickleball Show. And until next week, keep them low. The Pickleball Show is brought to you by PBX Club. PBX stands for Pickleball Excellence. Join today and get the latest pickleball tips and strategies, news and opinion. Save money on paddles and other equipment with coupon codes to online pickleball retailers. Get travel discounts to tournaments and a whole lot more. How much does it cost to become a PBX Club member? Well, it's free. Just go to freepbxclub.com. That's freepbxclub.com. There's even a link in the show notes for this episode. Free pbxclub.com. PBX Pickleball Excellence. Join the club. It's free.